that is due tomorrow. Uh, there's probably a 5 p.m. deadline marked in Miley online. It's probably okay if you go past that, but uh, do try and get it uh, as much as you can in by tomorrow, by the end of the day. I'll probably be grading that stuff starting Saturday morning, maybe a bit early. So, um, and I haven't heard prob hadn't heard any reports of problem of people having problems getting things to pass or not. But like I said, like I was just saying, I've only seen four, I think four or five, uh, where people have made some commits so far. So, so yeah. If, uh, I mean, if, if any of you guys are here, if you've had an issue or something, let me know. Or definitely, you know. I was going to encourage everybody, everybody to, to get working on it, um, um, do some work today so that, yeah, if you do seem to be having some issues, um, email me early as fast as you can so that, uh, um, uh, but hopefully, yeah, since since I did have some people look like they were able to get something working that, uh, that people mostly won't have problems. So. Um, I wasn't planning on going over in more detail on the assignment two unless people have questions on it uh, but uh, um, I can open up again I'll, I'll ask at the at the end again of class to see if anybody wants to ask a question about the assignment two uh, if you've been working on it need to clarify anything so I think um, be be careful you know, I don't know if this will apply to anybody that's here now, but do be careful that you are using the files in the correct place. So I had at least one person, I think, of the ones that had submitted stuff that seemed to have moved some data files into the notebooks and was not using relative paths. So all the data files should be up one into the data directory. Um, you know, you shouldn't shouldn't move things around in order for your paths to work. You should use the the, the files and the directories where they're at. Um, but that was the only thing I think I noted among the three or the four that I've looked at so far that had made some commits. So. Um, okay, so I'll move on. Uh, my plan was that, so we are actually. Um, so our unit this week was over the third chapter, uh, the one after the end-to-end -end example. So it was really jumping into looking and talking about classification. So um, I think for the rest of the time today, I'll try to leave a little bit of time at the end to again ask if anybody wants to uh, ask a question about the the actual um, assignment that you're working on. But um, but yeah, for the rest of the time, I was going to go over this notebook, the, the two notebooks on the classification, which we're covering uh, chapter four. So we open that up. Um, so let's go ahead and start with that. So. Some of the, we're finally getting into some things, so there's some cross-validation cells that happen on this that might take a minute or so, depending on the system you have. Uh, but yeah, or the, the second one, the multi-class classification has some that might take longer, so I probably won't, re, won't try to rerun that notebook while I'm talking about it. So, um, okay. So let me start. Um, we are using the um, MNIST, or well, the Chapter 3, if, if you're reading the textbook is using MNIST for most all the examples uh, for the classification stuff it goes over. Uh, we briefly mentioned those last time, although I just I, I remember from last time, uh, the actual data set, um, the, it's actually what, 28 by 28, so it must have been a reduced one that I was using in the example notebook I had, so it was only like 8 by 8 when I talked about it on Tuesday. So, so the real MNIST data set looks more like this. So you get 28 by 28, which gives you 784 features. Um, although for these data, the, uh, the I mean, every feature is, is the same thing. It's just a pixel value between 0 and 255. So kind of uh, how hard, it's a gray scale, but it was how hard the person was pressing for a digit, right? But these are real handwritten digits that were collected um, and what and you know if, if you read the chapter um, um, this really is kind of a uh, it is used as for a lot of examples and also for a lot of just testing new um, uh, methods 
Um, so it really is kind of like the fruit fly machine learning. So you'll see MNIST. So it's a good thing just to, to be familiar with the basics of this data set. So um, um, in the rest of this, we are basically um, going to, you know, there's 70,000 samples. Typically, people uh, split off the first 60,000 and train stuff with. Um, and uh, use the last 10,000 uh, to do some testing. Although, uh, if you haven't done the readings, uh, we also introduce in Chapter 3 another method for seeing how well your models generalize. So this cross-validation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that here as well. So, um, um, but uh, yeah, in this data set, oh, in, in this data, we, we can just do a simple split. We don't have to shuffle the stuff or anything because the um, the MNIST data set, if you load it from scikit-learn, they're really pretty much all shuffled already anyway, so you mostly don't have to worry about um, um, uh, having your data you know skewed if you just split off the last 10,000 to hold that back for testing here. Um, Okay, so let's talk about classification. So up to this point in the class, we've mostly been doing examples with regression. Um, although, like your your um, your your assignment that you're working on right now, the second part is to actually do a classification, a binary classification, which we really haven't um, uh, actually explicitly talked about yet. Um, so let's look at that. So you know, the MNIST data set, um, it's really a multi-class problem. So you know. It, the, the, the general thing that you want to do is from an image build a model that will predict what is the digit that's in that image, right? So there's 10 classes, uh, 0 through 9. All right, so that's the full thing you'd want to do. Uh, but we can turn it into a binary classification. Um, we showed this last time as well. Um, since we were using a reduced version of the MNIST. So we could build a 5 not 5 classifier in order to talk about binary classification, right? So, so uh, we do that real easily right here. So again, using like NumPy. Um, so uh, we take the training data, which has uh, from above has 0, 1, 2, up to 9 as an integer value, but we, we change this into a Boolean array. So it's true wherever we had a 5. So the very first one was a 5, and everything else in the first 10 was a not, a not 5. So we're going to use that to do a binary, build, build some binary classification models, right? So, but this is what our labels look like now. So we can just keep these booleans; those will work fine um, um, if we feed these in as a fit for uh, most scikit-learn models here. Um, so that's what we have. So, so we've got basically we're going to train with these sixty thousand. Um, Notice that um, here is kind of a, a cheap way, but uh, we could have done this in different ways, but we're counting up the number of things that was true here, right? So the sum, everything that's true will evaluate as one, everything that's false will evaluate as zero, and we ask to sum it up. So this means there's 5,421 fives, um, and 6,000 minus that are non-fives uh, in our data that we're going to train with, right? So a question we can ask is, I mean, was that a good split? All right, so think, thinking about data exploration here, uh, we would expect, if everything is evenly divided, that exactly 10% of the digits would be five, right? So we're a little bit, we, so you know, one thing you can tell from this, the MNIST data isn't exactly split up. So we got a little bit less than 10%, although maybe that's a function of, Maybe we've got more than 10% in the uh, the test data set, the 10,000 that we held back, right? So maybe the, the fives are overrepresented. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I might not have added. Uh, oh, um, um, I was working on this this morning. Um, there's a few things in here that I added and pushed back. So if you see some stuff that's not in the notebook you have, you should do a git pull to pull these things down. But um, But yeah, I hadn't asked before. So we might want to ask, like in the the data we held back for testing, um, does it have more than 10 percent? But but they both had a little bit around 9 percent. In fact, it was still less than 9 percent uh, in the test. So that tells me um, that um, um, I, I wasn't over or underrepresented in the data I'm going to use to train. Also, that tells me we don't have exactly a 10 percent 
representation of everything in the MNISD data. So some digits are a little bit less than 10%, presumably some are probably a little bit more. That would be a good question. We might want to find out the percentage of all of those digits, uh, but uh, I'll leave that as an exercise for you guys. So, um, so yeah, we, we jump right in. Um, the, uh, we will be talking about different models that you can use for building classifiers in this class. We won't talk a lot about the SGD, the Stochastic Gradient Descent, uh, but it's a very basic, it, it builds a linear classifier um, um, similar to the logistic regression that you're using for your assignment two. So, so they should end up getting pretty similar performance if you use the STD classifier or the logistic regression classifier. Uh, but um, the, you should be familiar with the pattern or you know once you're doing the assignment two, you should be familiar with the pattern, right? If we build something that's a classifier um, and, we do, and we fit it to our training data, we now have a, a, a classifier model. And since we, we gave it labels that were Boolean, we're going to get a binary classifier here. It's going to try to predict true or false or zero or one. Uh, one thing I'll point out for this notebook, um, um, it, you may have missed it, but we're actually passing in the random state here. So what that does is that sets the, the random number seed, the random number generator seed to this value. So everything I do after this will have exactly the same numbers. If, if you use that 42, you should get the same numbers in terms of the um, um, uh, the, the your accuracy and your recall and precision and stuff by setting that seed. If you, if you use a different seed, you'll get close but slightly different numbers than what I'm going to show here next. So, so that's, that's the first question um, that's brought up in Chapter 3 is, um, so how do we evaluate the performance of how, how well this STD classifier is doing on, on this data set, right? So um, Again, we haven't talked about this detail a lot, but we looked at evaluating the performance for regression. Uh, it's actually easier for regression because basically you can just say, my predictions, how much of an error, so how different is each prediction from the actual true regression value? Take the difference of that and basically sum up and average those, dif those differences. Actually, you take the square of those differences and sum them up. But that gives you one number that's kind of a good measure. That, that's the least squared errors. Um, and we'll talk more about that. But, but for regression, uh, there's other measures you can do, but really le least squared, uh, just summing up the difference of the errors uh, is kind of a good measure of the accuracy. It doesn't really work for classification uh, because, for example, you know, what's the difference between if I predict true and it's false, is that a difference of one or zero? I mean, you can sum those up. That, that's really what accuracy is going to be doing here. So for a binary class, classifier, the first thing we can ask um, is uh, how accurate was our classifier on the data set? Um, and uh, you can easily do that. So, so here, what we did was um, we predicted on the test set. So we're using the test set immediately right here uh, in what I just did. Um, and then uh, this accuracy score, I mean, we could have calculated this ourselves. The accuracy is just how many times are the predictions that I just had the same as the labels in the test set. So you know, I could have just wrote a loop or, or just done, done a little bit of, um, of NumPy vectorized operations to do that. In fact, you should get the same result uh, if I just do, um, so for example, if we do, where, where these two are equal. So if I do y predict, so where those are equal, um, um, I predict it correctly, and when they're not equal, um, I predict it incorrectly. So that, so 9,000, if you divide that by 10,000, we should get the 94% or 0 0.9492 accuracy, right? So that's all that this, you know, we could have written this, this, but we, we um, uh, uh, imported that from scikit-learn, but it's really a simple function, right? So that's all it's doing. So it, was that good? So that, that's the real question here. Um, is 94% accuracy good on, on with a, this classifier that predicts fives versus not fives, right? Um, So 
uh, I'm probably jumping ahead here, but uh, the, uh, oh yeah, I, I am jumping ahead here. Um, so yeah, like we say right here, oh, oh um, let, let me jump to this. So uh, the, the reason why accuracy in general might not be great is um, since only 10% the, the, our, our, our data for this binary classifier is relatively skewed. 10% of the items are fives and 90% of the items are not fives. So a simplistic classifier that always says false will get 90% accuracy or a bit better, right? So um, 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 is 94% significantly better? It's, it's doing something. The, the, this thing did do something. Uh, but, but is that really that much better than a simple always predicting that it's not a five? Right? That, that's the question we have to ask here. Um, and uh, it, it's really not because on the MNIST data set, uh, you can easily build classifiers that get 99, uh, 90, plus 99% accuracy, right? So 94%, it really isn't all that uh, impressive. Oh, it gets 99% accuracy on the full um, uh, multi-class problem, predicting any of the 10 digits. So, um, so let's go back, let's look at uh, cross-validation. So in the last class or two, I did mention a little bit, um, so the most basic thing we can do to evaluate performance is break up our data and only train on part of it and then see how it performs on the, the data it wasn't trained with. So that, that's a basic train-test split, okay? Uh, if you do cross-validation, that's a similar idea. It's, it's really the same idea, uh, but but what we're going to do is, in this case, uh, like we do here and like the textbook does, uh, we're going to do what's known as a cross-validation. Again, we're only using the, the training data here. So remember, we've, we've got 60,000 items in the training set. Uh, but uh, here, to estimate how well we're performing, um, how, how well we're generalizing, um, a basic cross-validation uh, will split the data up into parts and only train on some of those parts and then, and then evaluate on the part it wasn't trained with, okay? So here what we do is a three-fold, so K is three for our cross-validation. So that means of the 60,000, we split it up into to three, 20, uh, three parts of 20,000 samples each, right? So then what, what, do, and what this does, and, and again, this is a method uh, coming from scikit-learn, um, this splits it up for you. It trains um, the model that you give it. So we pass in the STD classifier. It retrains this model. It's going to retrain it three times. So it'll train it once where it holds back one of the three and trains it on the other, uh, on the other two, 40,000, and then tests it on that 20,000 that was held back. And it, it does that three times, holding back a different 20,000 piece each time, right? Um, so this is often called k-fold cross-validation. The, the k, can, you, can, you can do a, a five-fold or a ten-fold, same idea. So if I do ten-fold, it'll split it up into ten, train it on 90% of the data, and, and um, test it on the 10% it wasn't trained with. It'll do that ten times, right? So um, the advantage on this is, you know, if I, if I want to, I can use the whole, I could have used the whole, uh, 70,000 that I had and get kind of a feel for how it's doing if I train it uh, using all the data, how well it generalizes. Um, 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 um. But um, here, here, but since we do it multiple times, you know, I'm going to get some variation. Uh, but, you know, in general, we get a similar performance like we did here, about what, uh, the, the three times we're hovering, looks a little bit better, but that was probably just by chance. We're a little bit below 95%, uh, but we had 95 and even, even 96% for our three um, um, trainings and um, uh, validations on the held back data here. Um, anyway, we'll use both of those. So, um, and in fact, often we need to both cross-validate, but, but still hold back a final test set. So uh, to, to
to later on. We will talk more about this, but uh, often if I want to build multiple models and compare them, um, I want to, I'll want to see how well the model is generalized. And so I might use cross-validation on my train set. But then once I've done that, I, I might pick the one best model and I want to do a final evaluation on data that it never saw, uh, even in the cross-validation. So that's why we might split into a train and a validation set and then use cross-validation on that training data uh, for multiple models and do a final evaluation on that completely held back test set, so, which is kind of what we were doing here. Um, okay, but in general, back, back to this question, uh, accuracy, just pure accuracy is not going to be usually a good way to uh, measure the performance if I'm doing a um, classification problem. Um, we, we need to get a better feel of what's happening. So the most basic thing you can do, um, and I, I did ask you to do like a confusion matrix, I think, um, on assignment two. If I didn't, you'll have to do it like on assignment three. Um, but uh, we can uh, show the confusion matrix. So what this is doing, um, oh, and, and um, here we used another, again, a method from scikit-learn. Um, this wasn't the, um, the one we used before, the cross-validation score, this actually returned back the predictions. But notice the result of this was we had 60,000 predictions because, again, what happened here is we broke it into uh, k equals 3 folds. So uh, it did this three times. It returned me back 20,000 predictions on the held back for the first fold, and then 20,000 for the second fold, and 20,000 for the third, and it combined those all together. So this is 60,000 predictions. Uh, but again, these are predictions on data that it wasn't trained with. So these should be relatively good, uh, a, a good, um, 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 a good measure of how well it's going to do on generalizing, because these are predictions on held back data that it wasn't trained with. But but we do have predictions for the whole sixty thousand again, since we did it in this k-fold, three-fold cross validation way here. All right. Um, so since we have the predictions, uh, uh, we can use confusion matrix and another. Uh, again, we could have done this by hand relatively easily. But all this is showing is the rows are going to be the, um, um, the, the true, the labels. And the columns are going to be the predictions that were made. Um, so the first row is going to be, um, uh, is always going to be false for a binary. And the second one is going to always be true. So uh, this one is saying uh, first row, first column of um, um, uh, false. Sorry, false. So, so the first did I, did I mix that up? The, the first row is false. So we had uh, of the times when it was not a five, we we correctly predicted fifty three thousand eight hundred ninety two of the sixty thousand. When it wasn't a five, we correctly predicted it wasn't a five. That's what the upper left on the diagonal for the confused matrix is. Right. Uh, likewise, so the, the trues, uh, so here, 3,530 3, times, um, it was, was a 5, and we correctly predict it was a 5. Right. And then the off diagonals are going to be your, um, um, your false positives and your false negatives. So this one here um, is um, where it was actually true that it was a five, but we predicted it wasn't. And this one here is where it was actually not a five, but we predicted it was a five. All right. And if if um, um, if that kind of went past you, th this I I like this figure from the textbook to try and remember this. So if you're talking about binary classification, um, uh, that confusion matrix will always be laid out like this. Um, so you have your true negative count and your true positive count for the confusion matrix. Um, this will be your false negative. So these are the ones where um, um, it was actually a 5, but I predicted it was not a 5. So I falsely said it was not a 5, false negative. And up here will be your, your, your false positive count. So um, it was um, um, 
uh, it was not a five, and I said it was a five. Okay. Um, okay, so this gives us a better feel for not only the correct predictions I'm doing, but where I was incorrect and how I was incorrect. Um, um, uh, places where um, I was saying it was uh, a five when it wasn't, and places where it was saying uh, where it was a five, and I predict incorrectly that it wasn't. Um, so yeah, for if um, uh, you know if, if you build a classifier that's working perfectly, you'll get nothing on your false positives and false negatives, and you'll get everything on the 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 correct diagonal. Um, so you know again, we we we're using this method from scikit-learn, but it's relatively easy using NumPy to do that by hand if you wanted to. So, for example, the, the true negatives are the places, we're using some masking here, so we're using some vectorized operations, but the, um, the, the, the places where uh, the label was false, so I need a mask first, so all the places where um, uh, it's false, I want to see if I correctly predicted it was false, right? So that should end up being the count of the places where uh, I said it was false uh, when it was false. Our, our true negatives. Um, and then the, the converse of that, so the places where um, I said it was true, uh, uh, where uh, it, it should have been predicting false, would give you the false positives here. So again, here, uh, I, I should have said false. I should have said it was not a five, but I was saying it was a five. So those are false positive because I predicted positive incorrectly. Okay. And, and likewise. So these should be getting the same numbers um, that were coming out for the confusion matrix here. Again, that's, you know, this method um, is this, we could have written this by hand, but uh, you can just pull that from scikit-learn um, to compute the confusion matrix. Um, okay, so, you know, I, I do find the confusion matrix, um, um, I usually do that first, right? So that gives you some insight into the raw kind of performance, you know, how well we're doing um, um, on correct predictions and, and where, uh, which way we're doing in terms of false positives or false negatives. Right? Um, so the textbook spends some time talking about precision and recall and um, the, um, um, the ROC curves. Um, th you should learn these. So if we want to have one number that's a measure of how well we're doing, um, or you know something that's kind of a summary of the confusion matrix, we can use these concepts of precision and recall. So um, the way I think of it, just go ahead and run these. Um, this is a, a, again, I'll come back to this figure here. This, this is a good way to um, um, figure out what's being calculated. So these are used a lot, so you'll run across these precision and recall measures if, if, if people are talking about building a, a classifier uh, as a model. Um, precision um, is, you know, defined as the, it's just the ratio of the true positives to the, the sum of the true positives and the false positives. So it's the ratio of the, the, the true positives that I got correct over this sum here, right? This gives you um, a, um, a measure of, um, of, of every time when, in this case, when it was a five, what is the ratio that I'm getting all the fives? That I'm saying that's a five. Uh, when it's a, uh, a five out there. So you know, uh, in this case, uh, for this this uh, example from the textbook, uh, we had four examples uh, where um, we said it was a five, uh, and and we were correct three of those four times. Right. So seventy five percent of the time, um, we were. Um, correct uh, whenever we said it was true. That 
great way to say it. So, um, versus um, here, so for recall, um, the, 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 the ratio for recall is the true process over the sum of, of this one here, the true positives and the false negatives. So this gives you a measure of, um, of um, I had five fives in this data set. I only correctly identified it three of the five times. So I had 60% recall here. Right? Um, so it's good to get an intuitive feel of these. It's, again, this is another thing that I just added on here. Um, so maybe, let me point you to this here. So for example, um, I like their analogy on this. Um, so for precision, you think of a, of a detective solving crimes. Um, the, the problem is, is that if you're accusing people falsely, you know, that's bad, right? So uh, precision is that you're not making false accusations. Um, um, so if you have high precision, you're not having a lot of those false positives, right? So for a detective, if you're low on precision, that means you accuse, I mean, you, you, you find all the guilty people, but you accuse everybody, right? So you can get a perfect precision by saying everybody's guilty, everybody was a murderer. Um, 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 so you'll be guaranteed that, that you identify the murderers, but you have a lot of people falsely accused, right? That, so recall then, though, um, 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 is that, uh, so in that case, uh, you're not letting anybody, you're not letting any murderers slip through the cracks if you have high precision. So, so, uh, so on the other end, uh, high recall would mean that, um, um, yeah, um, we're making certain that everybody that was a five or everybody that was a murder, we're, we're identifying those. So on, on this example here, 60%, we only had... 60% uh, uh, recall. We, we missed um, saying some things were fives, that two of the fives uh, were fives here. All right. Anyway, um, it's, it's, so, so those are used a lot. You'll see those um, um, out in the literature uh, in lots of places. It's, it's kind of good to get uh, um, an intuitive feel for what those are. It's easy to calculate those by hand. Um, so again, the precision is just the ratio of the true positives over that, the sum of those of, of that and the false positives, uh, and the recall is the ratio of the true positives. So notice in both of these, we're, we're really concentrating on the two true positives. Uh, on the, um, uh, um, the, the, the class that's true or the yes in our binary classification here. Right? Um, and that's something that um, um, uh, our, maybe our textbook, I don't think our textbook discusses this, but it can make a difference. So usually there is one class that should obviously be the one that you identify as the true or the yes. So if I want to build a spam classifier, uh, the, the, the purpose is I want to identify spam email. So really spam should be the, the true, the yes, the one class and non-spam should be the zero, right? If I want to build a, a cancer classifier, uh, people with cancer should be the true, um, and the, 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 the non-cancer should be the false or the no, right? Uh, sometimes it's not quite so obvious, but, but, uh, but, uh, but you do want to have it kind of in the right way. Um, um, that, that helps also make these make more sense or make these more useful if you're measuring precision and recall. So as, as I'm working up to, th there's a trade-off for these as well. So, um, anyway, so back to th these are easy to uh, um, calculate by hand, but uh, you know, you can, uh, again, you can just use um, um, methods from scikit-learn. So you know, we've got precision and recall score as well. These will do this, the same thing. This will capture the same ratio, so you should get the same result using those or, or doing it by hand. So, um, so yeah, here was recall, and uh, here was the precision doing it by hand or using the, the precision score um, from scikit-learn. So. 
Um, okay, so so if you're thinking of performance in terms of this precision and recall measure, uh, there, there's really a trade-off. Um, so you can usually, for one particular model, once you've trained it, um, I can change what's known as the decision threshold uh, if, I, if I need to in order to be more precise, but that will always make, it, uh, give, make recall worse or vice versa. I can change that threshold uh, to, be, uh, to, to increase my recall score, but it will reduce the uh, precision score. So, um, so the re the way that works is that m w a classifier like. For example, like we're showing here, if you ask for the decision function, it will give you one number. So if you ask for the, uh, the final prediction, you just get 0 or 1 if it's a binary classification. But you can ask for uh, the decision function or the probability for some classifiers. Um, so what this gives you is some number. And, and what it does is, um, so this is really the decision boundary, like you're working on your assignment 2. And we will get more, we'll talk more about the decision boundary and how that's created for uh, logistic regression or other classifiers. So, but from that one number, um, basically, uh, so normally for mostly classifiers, we use zero as the decision boundary. So anything bigger than zero, uh, if we ask to make your final prediction, would get returned as a true or a one. And anything less than zero would get returned as a false. So like in, in this case, for the digit um, at index 0, um, if we ask for that score, we got this big 2,000 score. Um, and if we ask for the prediction, since that's bigger than 0, it'll come out as true. It'll predict true that this is a 5 for that digit. There. Um, So if you take these scores, um, so you can also use cross-validation predict, that'll return you like a, um, a this prediction score instead of the actual final prediction. Right? But then you can use that to vary the threshold, um, which is, again, this figures come directly from chapter three. Uh, we're just recreating them here. Right? So the default um, is the threshold here is zero. So the default that we were getting was giving us a um, um, a precision at 0.83, um, and, uh, and the uh, the recall down here um, at um, yeah, it was a little bit above 0.6, right? So it was about 0.83 something. Right? So, but if we were to change that threshold, um, you know, it would vary the the you know they they will inversely affect each other, right? And so you'll always get a if you plot precision and recall versus that threshold. Um, you'll always get something like this, where they, they cross over. Um, on one direction, you'll be maximizing precision at the cost of recall. And if you go the other direction, if you change the threshold lower, you'll be maximizing recall at the, um, at the cost of precision. Right. So um, kind of a final thing on this. This is for a real model. So if you go off and become a data scientist um, and you're building a model to actually uh, uh, do something for a product in production, uh, at the end, this, this becomes important because depending on what you're doing, you might want to be maximizing precision or recall. Um, um, so again, like if you want to minimize the false positives, uh, you want to be highly precise. So uh, I go back to the cancer patient. Uh, if, if I'm building a bin binary classifier to predict whether somebody has cancer or not from some input data, um, if, you have a, if you have lots of false positives, you're going to be telling a lot of people that uh, they have cancer when they don't. And then you're going to give them stress. Uh, they're going to have to spend money to do more tests and things, right? So, so, uh, so in that case, um, uh, but 
on the other hand, um, if you have a lot of false negatives, that's even worse. Because when it's life, life or death, you really don't want to tell people that they don't have cancer when they really do. Right? So for, for certain things, like, like the uh, building an application to predict whether somebody has cancer or not, you probably want to uh, maximize that recall or get it pretty high because you want to get rid of these. So even though you might stress people out, they might be spending some more money, it's really bad if you tell people they don't have cancer and they die. Right. So that's that's the trade-off that's kind of happening here. Okay. Uh, but you know it could be different. You know sometimes though these the, the the expense is more important from false positives. So in that case you want to go the other way for some kinds of problems. Um, all right. So, oh, you can get kind of the same kind of thing. So the textbook also shows if we, instead of plotting these as, as separate curves uh, where we're varying threshold, uh, we, we can just plot uh, for each threshold value what precision and recall is. So we're plotting these as one curve together. It's really the same information, just presented in a different way. Um, um, so again, as you would change threshold up or down, um, that would um, um, be represented by going this way or that way on the on the same curve here. Right? So for our particular zero threshold, we're right here, which was what the red dots from our textbook was, where we were getting um, uh, 0.83 precision and uh, point uh, five. I think it's the same um, as. The zero point. Oh no, it was this point here. So, so if we were to plot the zero, the zero that we had, it should have been somewhere over um, about uh, about right here. So that's where the that's where the default um, threshold was. And this this was the if you read the example from the textbook, they were saying, okay, if I need to get a um, precision of of um, ninety percent. What should I set, set the threshold so I get my precision at 90%? Right? And that, that was where this red line was coming from in the textbook. And the one here is, is that's where the threshold gives us the 90% uh, um, precision at the cost of recall going down a little bit. Um, okay. Um, and real quickly, I, I might ask you to do the ROC curve on assignment three or at some point. Uh, it's similar, this, th this came out of a slightly different um, 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 group of people, but they like to use what they call this, the receiver operating ca characteristics or the area under the curve uh, here, the AUC. Um, Oops, let me see if I can remember the. Um, it's it's doing a similar thing to when we plotted precision and recall together, but it's using slightly different measures. Um, and I'll let you read the textbook on it. Um, uh, actually, one of these measures is exactly the same as recall. So it's plotting recall against not precision, but something else, the the false positive rate. Right. Um, so, so we're kind of doing the same thing here, but. Uh, instead of um, um, precision, we use something else um, and plot those uh, together. So recall and this something else. Um, uh, but here, the, the point of this or the point here is that the more area under the curve, the better that your model is doing overall, right? So, you know, for one particular trained model, I can always tweak precision at the cost of recall or maximize recall at the cost of precision. But if I need to do better for both of them, I'm going to have to train a different model that does better. Um, uh, that, that's just a better model. Right? Um, and so if you're comparing two models, you can, you can uh, train the two models and plot them on a precision recall or on one of these um, ROC curves. Right? Uh, and that's, that was kind of the last thing for the first part of chapter three. I'll show that. So so here, instead of using STD is a basic, it, it's not going to perform well. 
we could, we, there's much more sophisticated classifiers than STD or logistic regression, including forest, uh, including trees, like a random forest classifier, which we're going to talk about in this class. Um, so here, if we build a random uh, forest classifier um, and we um, do the same thing we just did for the SGD classifier, so we ask it to give us uh, the predictions um, um, on, uh, and we plot those two uh, together on either precision recall or the ROC curve. We get something like this. So this was the original SGD model, um, and this was the random forest, right? So a better model has more area under the curve, on, on whichever one you're visualizing on this. So this is often, again, it's not, we don't necessarily, you know, just want to just straightforward compare the accuracy of these models on a test set if we're doing classification. Right. This gives us a much better feel for which model over a range of different thresholds is going to do on precision recall in this case. Right. So, so you know, it's obvious that the random forest is much closer. The best you can do is get 100% of the area. So get all the way up in the corner there. Find these together. Right. But again, this was recall precision like we did for both of those or um, or the, the ROC curve. Same kind of idea with just um, one slightly different measure. But you get a similar result um, comparing the stochastic gradient descent versus the, uh, the random forest. So um, just to summarize that, um, I may or may not have you do that, but yeah, if, if you're building classifier, if you're, if you're doing classification uh, if you, and you need to comp compare the performance of two classifiers, this is one of the best tools to use. Uh, plot them on recall versus precision or on one of these ROCs um, and look at the area under the curve that they, that they have to see which one is doing better overall, no matter what the threshold is set at for the model. All right. Um, okay. So that was the basics for binary classification. Um, so I won't spend quite as much time on the other one. Um, so uh, and I'm pr probably shouldn't rerun this one. So this one has some some cells that probably take you a couple minutes to to. Uh, to finish up, um, if you don't, um, um, uh, depending on your computer hardware and things. Uh, so let's go to the, the most general case then, right? So really what we wanted, would like to do for the MNIST training data set that we had is uh, actually build a full classifier that can predict not just fives or not fives, but the actual digit given the input image, right? So for that, we need, the textbook calls it multi-class classification, right? So the, the difference being instead of a, uh, a label that's 0, 1, that just has two values, it can have multiple levels, multiple classes. Right? Um, so um, we can always turn uh, a multi-class classification problem into a bunch of binary classifications, okay? And in fact, uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but some classifiers can't really do multi-class classification directly. So for those classifiers, we really have to uh, turn the problems into a bunch of separate binary classification problems and then combine the results from those, right? Um, so if you did, did the readings from chapter three, it goes into that a little bit. The, some of this will be done for you automatically by scikit-learn. So you don't have to do this by hand if you want to build a multi-class classification for SGD classifier. It doesn't support um, multi-class um, classification directly. Right? So behind the scenes, if you ask an SGD classifier to, like we're doing here, to fit on the whole lab set of labels, where we have 10 classes, uh, it will by default do the uh, one versus all, um, like it's talked about here. 
right? Which is really, so for one versus all is, is what we just did. So you build a classifier to, to classify zeros and not zeros, one and not ones, two and not twos. So you build, if I have 10 classes, I will need 10, I'll need to train 10 classifiers. Um, and then all of those um, uh, for certain kinds of classifiers can give a, a prediction, like a probability. Like um, I might predict my, my zero classifier might give me a 10% probability that's a zero. And my um, nine classifier might give it a 90% chance it's a nine, right? And then for a one versus all, you just pick the one that, that gave the highest probability and predict this, that class. Um, so that has the advantage that it's linear. So, it, so for one versus all, um, if I have 10 classes, I just need to build 10 separate classifiers. And then I combine them by taking the one that gives me the highest predicted probability. So you can also use uh, uh, one versus one. Uh, where you build a, a classifier of, of zero versus one, zero versus twos, right? So in that case, you actually need more than ten. Um, so you know, if you work it out, um, I would need what? Uh, it grows with the square, but you would need um, forty-five, like it shows says here. Um, um, so to combine, in that case, you would find the one that wins the most. So everything would have a classifier versus everything else, and the one that, that won the most from running it through all the train classifiers would be the, the what you would predict if you're using one versus all. Right? So there's some trade-offs. Um, so you have to build more classifiers, but like if I'm doing just ones versus twos, I'm not training on the whole data set. I have to take out all the, only the ones where I had ones and twos and just train on that subset of the data set. So, so while you have to build more classifiers, each classifier is trained on less data. So, um, um, anyway, the, um, um, uh, you probably, beyond this, beyond this lecture or reading this part in the chat, the, the textbook, we won't come back to this again. It's good to know, though, that you know, um, um, Scikit-Learn is doing some stuff behind the scenes for you uh, for some classifiers if you want to really build a general multi-class classifier. It, it has to, you, you, if you have to do this by hand, you have to do a lot of work to, to really set that up and, and uh, get it to work for something that doesn't naturally, uh, is, isn't able to naturally train and output uh, multi, multiple classes as the output, as the prediction. Um, all right, so um, another thing I wanted to mention, um, um, I just wanted to kind of point your attention to this in jobs. Um, if you use that, um, um, let me see if I used it on the other one. Well, um, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, I don't really want to rerun these cells. So, um, for some things in Scikit Learn, it can it can um, take advantage of CPU resources that you have on your system. Uh, it, it can't do this for all fitting or training or other things that you do, but for both, like cross validation, um, and and for some f uh, fitting of classifiers. Um, so the default though is it, it only uses like one thread, uh, but but here like especially if it's having to build a bunch of classifiers when you do a fit, um, if you specify in jobs that can greatly speed up your fitting or your cross validation when you do it because here um, if I'm doing one versus one I actually have to build ten classifiers. So if I have uh, if you have a system that has ten cores or ten CPUs. Uh, it, it, could, it will use as many cores as you have to do those in parallel. So it can potentially be 10 times faster, um, or it can use every CPU core that you have. So it's a good, good kind of um, prayer. I don't know why by default they don't do that. By default, it'll only use one unless you specify that. So, um,
Okay, so some details of that. So you'll notice, like you would expect, if I build a multi-class classifier, um, we should have most of the same functions that we had for the binary, all the same functions that we had for the STD that we were just doing. If you ask it to predict, you'll get a single prediction. So whatever it's doing, one versus one, one versus all, or if it natively supports multi-class, uh, it will put it down to whatever it thinks is the best thing to predict uh, for the data you asked to predict on. But if you ask for like the decision function or the probabilities, you can see, so here for the raw decision function, we get the number, which is that same kind of threshold that we had, but we'll get 10 of these. We'll get one for each one of our output classes. Right? So in this case, um, um, this are, w these aren't really probabilities, but uh, the same idea, whichever is the largest one would be the one that we would want to select if, we asked, if we're asked to make a final prediction. So if you look through these, the largest one was the three, which is why, um, 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 so this is zero, one, two. So three was, was positive. Most of the rest of these were a negative score here. Um, um, and you can force it to do uh, one versus one instead of one versus all, or vice versa. Um, but we, we probably won't need that for this class, but you can do that if you need it. Um, so let's see what else. So yeah, I, I don't know what, uh, sometimes, you know, um, you use a decision function, sometimes you can use the uh, similar method, but to give the probability predictions, um, we will talk more about the difference of those uh, in this course um, at different points. Um, but for random forest, you can directly get an estimate of the probability. So if you sum these up, you'll notice that they sum up to one. Um, and it's, it's giving like a 90% probability that it's a five here. So one, two, three, four, five, and uh, uh, thinks 8% chance that it's a, a three uh, and so on. Um, okay. Uh, oh, so back to a little bit about accuracy. I don't know if we showed doing the accuracy for the uh, the SGD, um, like doing cross validation to get a sense of how accurate our train uh, SGD class file was on the full multi class problem here. Uh, I guess we didn't, uh, but uh, but yeah. So here we can see. Um, for example, for the, the random forest that we just created, um, uh, we can do that same cross-validation that we did, but, um, um, but we're doing it on the full 10 classes here. So notice that now we're getting accuracies around 85%, 86%, 87% um, on, our, uh, on our threefold cross-validation here. So, but this, you know, you might um, be surprised, but, but uh, here when we live, before I wasn't, very impressed by the SGD um, at 94%. Uh, but here, uh, even though it's a lot, it's, it's less, 85, 86%, but this is on the full class. You know, so if we were just randomly guessing, we would expect a performance of about 10%. So you know, this, this is doing quite a bit better than random guessing, random chance, than what we were doing uh, when we were just a five or not five binary classification. So, um, but yeah, like is discussed here or in the textbook, you know, this really isn't that great though because we can get uh, easily get 99% above 99% um, um, if we do some tweaking um, on the M and IST data set. Um, um, oh, yeah, like it shows here, if, we, if uh, you know, to begin thinking about that, uh, we will get a pretty good improvement if we just scale the data. Um, so even though these are all pixel values, if we just scale from zero to one for the random forest, um, we improve from mid 80s to about 90 percent uh, by applying some uh, scaling on there. Um, okay, but yeah, but like we mentioned, you know, accuracy is probably not a good thing to just rely on if you want to get an idea of how you're performing. So we could do the same things we talked about for the binary classification. So you know, we could show out the confusion matrix. Um, um, 
in this case, there, you know, so what you would expect for the confusion matrix is the same thing. So this should be, the top row should be the zero predictions and then one, two through the nines. Uh, and then the column should be the, uh, uh, so these are the true values of the rows and then the predictions are in the columns here. So the diagonal is going to be where we were correct and the off diagonal is our errors that we had for the, um, um, we're using, oh, we're back to using the STD, the, the bad classifier here. Um, but yeah, so in this case, when you have more than a binary, the confusion matrix might be a little bit tough to see what's going on, so you might want to start visualizing. Um, so we could just plot this out and use a color bar to, to tell us. Uh, but here, since everything is mostly uh, uh, on the diagonal for the correct results, uh, we might want to like zero out that diagonal. Um, and we might also want to, instead of getting the absolute counts, uh, get the ratios of these to the total number of samples that we had. So this, we can begin then to get, uh, for the STD classifier, um, um, it does, it seems to be doing particularly badly on the H for some reason. I don't remember if the textbook discusses this or not. But you can see that, that all of our, a lot of our predictions on the H had higher error rates than the background here. Um, um, you can kind of also see that uh, it mixes up, the, the textbook does discuss this, so the threes and the fives and the fives and the threes, um, so, so we get a little bit of a hit on those. Um, and um, um, I thought, I'm misremembering. That the nines and the sevens are probably a little bit above, um, uh, above kind of the background as well. So, but the threes and the fives are probably a little bit more obvious um, on this one here. Um, so, just to show that, I mean, again, this is all from from the textbook, uh, recreating the stuff in the chapter three here. Uh, maybe one final point on that is so, I mean, the textbook does, this is the kind of stuff if you really are going to try to get into the guts of improving the performance on a classification model, you'd want to do stuff like this. So once you get something working, you want to go in and try and understand why, where, what it's doing right, but where it's failing, what it's getting incorrect. So yeah, if we look at the three and the fives, you know, these are examples of correct threes and correct fives, but these are examples of, of where um, it was a five, but we predicted a three, and these are examples where it was a three, but we predicted a five. So, um, or just for threes and fives, the uh, uh, false positives and false negatives. Um, so, uh, one final, uh, so one thing, just I'll, I'll just kind of point out, I don't remember if the textbook discusses this, but it's all, it can also be the case that you've got some bad data, some incorrectly labeled stuff. So it could very well be, like if you look at that one, uh, that really should have been labeled a five, but it's been labeled a three. So it's not surprising that uh, it's making a mistake on that one, um, as well as some other, a lot of these are pretty sloppy. But, uh, but that one in particular looks like it might be mislabeled. Uh, I mean, that might be a three there too, so maybe another mislabel on the other side, I don't know. Um, okay, so besides multi, multi, having one output but that, that has multiple levels, uh, you can also build classifiers that maybe have uh, two outputs. So that's, our textbook calls that multi-label classification. So in this case, both of the outputs we're trying to predict are binary. So we're trying to train a model that predicts either, um, uh, either if the value is odd, so true or false, it's odd, so it's a binary, or if the value is greater than seven, so it's big. So either it's, it's less than seven, or it's seven, eight, or nine, right? But so in this case though, we have two outputs, but they're both binary. But uh, scikit-learn can handle that pretty easily, uh, just directly. Although, again, behind the scenes, um, it's really building two classifiers. Um, um, and then the most general case is where, you know, um, you have outputs. Uh, they're both uh, multiple outputs, and the outputs um, can be, you know, not just binary, more than one level. 
Um, okay, yeah, so I, I wanted to kind of stop there. Uh, I mean, I wanted to give kind of a chance again, like I said. So has anybody um, had anything about the second assignment I wanted to ask about? I'll circle back to that, see if anybody that's here today wanted to, um, anything need clarifying. So uh, if you guys had missed it, uh, I mean, I, I was checking. Some people have. I had four or five people have made some commits, and uh, it did look like it was working. You guys are a little bit like guinea pigs, um, uh, so I was worried that maybe some people might have some problems getting the the, uh, the, uh, the, the auto grader test to pass, but it does look like it, it, they do work, or at least some people were getting them working. Um, all right, yeah, so that's it. I'll let you guys go. I can stick around for a few minutes.